Mr. Prohachin, a short story by Fyodor Dostoevsky. In the darkest and humblest corner of Ustinya, Fyodorovna's flat lived Semyon Ivanovich Prohachin, a well-meaning elderly man who did not drink. Since Mr. Prohachin was of a very humble grade in the service and received a salary strictly proportionate to his official capacity, Ustinya Fyodorovna could not get more than five rubles a month from him for his lodging. Some people said that she had her own reasons for accepting him as a lodger, but be that as it may, as though in despite of all his detractors, Mr. Prohachin actually became her favourite, in an honourable and virtuous sense, of course. It must be observed that Ustinya Fyodorovna, a very respectable woman who had a special partiality for meat and coffee and found it difficult to keep the fasts, let rooms to several other boarders who paid twice as much as Semyon Ivanovich, yet not being quiet lodgers, but on the contrary, all of them spiteful scoffers at her feminine ways and her forlorn helplessness stood very low in her good opinion, so that if it had not been for the rent they paid, she would not have cared to let them stay nor indeed to see them in her flat at all. Semyon Ivanovich had become her favourite from the day when a retired, or perhaps more correctly speaking, discharged clerk with a weakness for strong drink was carried to his last resting place in Volkovo. Though this gentleman had only one eye, having had the other knocked out owing, in his own words, to his valiant behaviour, and only one leg, the other having been broken in the same way owing to his valour, yet he had succeeded in winning all the kindly feeling of which Ustinya Fyodorovna was capable and took the fullest advantage of it and would probably have gone on for years living as her devoted satellite and toady if he had not finally drunk himself to death in the most pitiable way. All this had happened at Pesky, where Ustinya Fyodorovna only had three lodgers, of whom, when she moved into a new flat and set up on a larger scale, Letting to about a dozen new boarders, Mr. Prohartchin was the only one who remained. Whether Mr. Prohartchin had certain incorrigible defects, or whether his companions were, every one of them, to blame, there seemed to be misunderstandings on both sides from the first. We must observe here that all Ustinya Fyodorovna's new lodgers, without exception, got on together like brothers. Some of them were in the same office. Each one of them by turns lost all his money to the others at Faro, Preference and Bix. They all liked in a merry hour to enjoy what they called the fizzing moments of life in a crowd together. They were fond, too, at times of discussing lofty subjects, and though in the end things rarely passed off without a dispute, yet as all prejudices were banished from the whole party, the general harmony was not in the least disturbed thereby. The most remarkable among the lodgers were Mark Ivanovich, an intelligent and well-read man, then Oplevaniev, then Prepolovenko, also a nice and modest person. Then there was a certain Zinovy Prokofievich, whose object in life was to get into aristocratic society. Then there was Okeanov, the copying clerk, who had in his time almost wrested the distinction of prime favourite from Semyon Ivanovich, then another copying clerk called Sudbin, the plebeian Kantarev. There were others, too. But to all these people Semyon Ivanovich was, as it were, not one of themselves. No one wished him harm, of course, for all had from the very first done Prohartchin justice, and had decided in Mark Ivanovich's words that he, Prohartchin, was a good and harmless fellow, though by no means a man of the world, trustworthy and not a flatterer, who had, of course, his failings, but that if he were sometimes unhappy, it was due to nothing else but lack of imagination. What is more, Mr. Prohartchin, though deprived in this way of imagination, could never have made a particularly favourable impression from his figure or manners, upon which scoffers are fond of fastening, yet his figure did not put people against him. Mark Ivanovich, who was an intelligent person, formally undertook Semyon Ivanovich's defence, and declared in rather happy and flowery language that Prohartchin was an elderly and respectable man who had long, long ago passed the age of romance. And so, if Semyon Ivanovich did not know how to get on with people, it must have been entirely his own fault. The first thing they noticed 
was the unmistakable parsimony and niggardliness of Semyon Ivanovich. That was at once observed and noted, for Semyon Ivanovich would never lend anyone his teapot, even for a moment, and that was the more unjust as he himself hardly ever drank tea, but when he wanted anything drank, as a rule, rather a pleasant decoction of wild flowers and certain medicinal herbs, of which he always had a considerable store. His meals, too, were quite different from the other lodgers. He never, for instance, permitted himself to partake of the whole dinner, provided daily by Ustinya Fyodorovna for the other boarders. The dinner cost half a rouble. Semyon Ivanovich paid only twenty-five kopecks in copper and never exceeded it, and so took either a plate of soup with pie or a plate of beef. Most frequently he ate neither soup nor beef, but he partook in moderation of white bread with onion, curd, salted cucumber, or something similar, which was a great deal cheaper, and he would only go back to his half-ruble dinner when he could stand it no longer. Here the biographer confesses that nothing would have induced him to allude to such realistic and low details, positively shocking and offensive to some lovers of the heroic style, if it were not that these details exhibit one peculiarity one characteristic in the hero of this story. For Mr. Prohartchin was by no means so poor as to be unable to have regular and sufficient meals, though he sometimes made out that he was. But he acted as he did regardless of obloquy and people's prejudices, simply to satisfy his strange whims, and from frugality and excessive carefulness. All this, however, will be much clearer later on. But we will beware of boring the reader with the description of all Semyon Ivanovich's whims, and will omit, for instance, the curious and very amusing description of his attire. And in fact, if it were not for Ustinya Fyodorovna's own reference to it, we should hardly have alluded even to the fact that Semyon Ivanovich never could make up his mind to send his linen to the wash, or if he ever did so, it was so rarely that in the intervals one might have completely forgotten the existence of linen on Semyon Ivanovich. From the landlady's evidence, it appeared that Semyon Ivanovich, bless his soul, poor lamb, for twenty years had been tucked away in his corner, without caring what folks thought, for all the days of his life on earth he was a stranger to socks, handkerchiefs, and all such things. And what is more, Ustinya Fyodorovna had seen with her own eyes, thanks to the decrepitude of the screen, that the poor dear man sometimes had had nothing to cover his bare skin. Such were the rumours in circulation after Semyon Ivanovich's death. But in his lifetime, and this was one of the most frequent occasions of dissension, he could not endure it if anyone, even somebody on friendly terms with him, poked his inquisitive nose uninvited into his corner, even through an aperture in the decrepit screen. He was a taciturn man difficult to deal with and prone to ill health. He did not like people to give him advice. He did not care for people who put themselves forward either, and if anyone jeered at him or gave him advice unasked, he would fall foul of him at once, put him to shame, and settle his business. You are a puppy. You are a featherhead. You are not one to give advice, so there, you mind your own business, sir. You'd better count the stitches in your own socks, sir, so there. Semyon Ivanovich was a plain man, and never used the formal mode of address to anyone. He couldn't bear it either when someone who knew his little ways would begin from pure sport, pestering him with questions, such as what he had in his little trunk. Semyon Ivanovich had one little trunk. It stood under his bed and was guarded like the apple of his eye, and though everyone knew that there was nothing in it except old rags, two or three pairs of damaged boots and all sorts of rubbish, yet Mr. Prohartchin prized his property very highly, and they used even to hear him at one time express dissatisfaction with his old but still sound lock and talk of getting a new one of a special German pattern with a secret spring and various complications when on one occasion Zinovy Prokofievich, carried away by the thoughtlessness of youth, gave expression to the very coarse and unseemly idea that Semyon Ivanovich was probably hiding and treasuring something in his box to leave to his descendants, everyone who happened to be by was stupefied at the extraordinary effects of Zinovy Prokofievich's sally.
At first, Mr. Prohartchin could not find suitable terms for such a crude and coarse idea. For a long time, words dropped from his lips quite incoherently, and it was only after a while they made out that Semyon Ivanovich was reproaching Zinovy Prokofievich for some shabby action in the remote past. Then they realized that Semyon Ivanovich was predicting that Zinovy Prokofievich would never get into aristocratic society, and that the tailor to whom he owed a bill for his suits would beat him, would certainly beat him, because the puppy had not paid him for so long. And finally, you puppy, you, Semyon Ivanovich added, here you want to get into the hussars, but you won't, I tell you, you'll make a fool of yourself. And I tell you what, you puppy, when your superiors know all about it, they will take and make you a copying clerk. So that will be the end of it. Do you hear, puppy? Then Semyon Ivanovich subsided, but after lying down for five hours, to the intense astonishment of everyone he seemed to have reached a decision, and began suddenly reproaching and abusing the young man again, at first to himself, and afterwards addressing Zinovy Prokofievich. But the matter did not end there, and in the evening, when Mark Ivanovich and Prepolovenko made tea and asked Okeanov to drink it with them, Semyon Ivanovich got up from his bed, purposely joined them, subscribing his fifteen or twenty kopecks, and on the pretext of a sudden desire for a cup of tea, began at great length going into the subject, and explaining that he was a poor man, nothing but a poor man, and that a poor man like him had nothing to save. Mr. Prohartchin confessed that he was a poor man on this occasion, he said, simply because the subject had come up, that the day before yesterday he had meant to borrow a rouble from that impudent fellow, but now he should not borrow it for fear the puppy should brag, that that was the fact of the matter, and that his salary was such that one could not buy enough to eat, and that finally a poor man, as you see, he sent his sister-in-law in Tver five roubles every month, that if he did not send his sister-in-law in Tver five roubles every month, his sister-in-law would die, and if his sister-in-law, who was dependent on him, were dead, he, Semyon Ivanovich, would long ago have bought himself a new suit, and Semyon Ivanovich went on talking in this way at great length about being a poor man, about his sister-in-law, and about roubles, and kept repeating the same thing over and over again to impress it on his audience till he got into a regular muddle and relapsed into silence. Only three days later, when they had all forgotten about him and no one was thinking of attacking him, he added something in conclusion to the effect that when Zinovy Prokofievich went into the hussars, the impudent fellow would have his leg cut off in the war, and then he would come with a wooden leg and say, Semyon Ivanovich, kind friend, give me something to eat. And then Semyon Ivanovich would not give him something to eat, and would not look at the insolent fellow, and that's how it would be, and he could just make the best of it. All this naturally seemed very curious, and at the same time fearfully amusing. Without much reflection, all the lodgers joined together for further investigation, and simply from curiosity determined to make a final onslaught on Semyon Ivanovich en masse. And as Mr. Prohartchin too had of late, that is, ever since he had begun living in the same flat with them, been very fond of finding out everything about them and asking inquisitive questions, probably for private reasons of his own, relations sprang up between the opposed parties without any preparation or effort on either side as it were, by chance, and of itself. To get into relations, Semyon Ivanovich always had in reserve his peculiar, rather sly, and very ingenuous manoeuvre, of which the reader has learned something already. He would get off his bed about tea-time, and if he saw the others gathered together in a group to make tea, he would go up to them like a quiet, sensible, and friendly person, hand over his twenty kopecks, as he was entitled to do, and announced that he wished to join them. Then the young men would wink at one another, and so indicating that they were in league together against Semyon Ivanovich would begin a conversation, at first strictly proper and decorous. Then one of the wittier of the party would, apropos of nothing, fall to telling them news consisting most usually of entirely false and quite incredible details. He would say, for instance, that someone had heard His Excellency that day telling Demid Vasilievich that in his opinion 
married clerks were more trustworthy than unmarried and more suitable for promotion, for they were steady, and that their capacities were considerably improved by marriage, and that therefore he, that is, the speaker, in order to improve and be better fitted for promotion, was doing his utmost to enter the bonds of matrimony as soon as possible with a certain Fevronia Prokofievna. Or he would say that it had more than once been remarked about certain of his colleagues that they were entirely devoid of social graces and of well-bred, agreeable manners, and consequently unable to please ladies in good society, and that therefore to eradicate this defect it would be suitable to deduct something from their salary, and with the sum so obtained, to hire a hall where they could learn to dance, acquire the outward signs of gentlemanliness and good breeding, courtesy, respect for their seniors, strength of will, a good and grateful heart, and various agreeable qualities. Or he would say that it was being arranged that some of the clerks, beginning with the most elderly, were to be put through an examination in all sorts of subjects to raise their standard of culture. And in that way, the speaker would add, all sorts of things would come to light, and certain gentlemen would have to lay their cards on the table. In short, thousands of similar very absurd rumours were discussed. To keep it up, everyone believed the story at once, showed interest in it, asked questions, applied it to themselves, and some of them, assuming a despondent air, began shaking their heads and asking everyone's advice, saying what were they to do if they were to come under it. It need hardly be said that a man far less credulous and simple-hearted than Mr. Prohartchin would have been puzzled and carried away by a rumour so unanimously believed. Moreover, from all appearances, it might be safely concluded that Semyon Ivanovitch was exceedingly stupid and slow to grasp any new, unusual idea, and that when he heard anything new, he had always first, as it were, to chew it over and digest it, to find out the meaning, and struggling with it in bewilderment, at last, perhaps to overcome it, though even then, in a quite special manner peculiar to himself alone. In this way, curious and hitherto unexpected qualities began to show themselves in Semyon Ivanovich. Talk and tittle-tattle followed, and by devious ways it all reached the office at last, with additions. What increased the sensation was the fact that Mr. Prohartchin, who had looked almost exactly the same from time immemorial, suddenly, apropos of nothing, wore quite a different countenance. His face was uneasy, his eyes were timid and had a scared and rather suspicious expression. He took to walking softly, starting and listening, and to put the finishing touch to his new characteristics developed a passion for investigating the truth. He carried his love of truth at last to such a pitch as to venture, on two occasions, to inquire of Demid Vasilievich himself concerning the credibility of the strange rumours that reached him daily by dozens, and if we say nothing here of the consequence of the action of Semyon Ivanovich, it is for no other reason but a sensitive regard for his reputation. It was in this way people came to consider him as misanthropic and regardless of the proprieties. Then they began to discover that there was a great deal that was fantastical about him, and in this they were not altogether mistaken, for it was observed on more than one occasion that Semyon Ivanovich completely forgot himself and sitting in his seat with his mouth open and his pen in the air, as though frozen or petrified, looked more like the shadow of a rational being than that rational being itself. It sometimes happened that some innocently gaping gentleman, on suddenly catching his straying, lustreless, questioning eyes, was scared, and all of a tremor, and at once inserted into some important document either a smudge or some quite inappropriate word. The impropriety of Semyon Ivanovich's behaviour embarrassed and annoyed all really well-bred people. At last, no one could feel any doubt of the eccentricity of Semyon Ivanovich's mind when one fine morning the rumour was all over the office that Mr. Prohartchin had actually frightened Demid Vasilievich himself. For meeting him in the corridor, Semyon Ivanovich had been so strange and peculiar that he had forced his superior to beat a retreat. The news of Semyon Ivanovich's behaviour reached him himself at last. Hearing of it, he got up at once, 
made his way carefully between the chairs and tables, reached the entry, took down his overcoat with his own hand, put it on, went out, and disappeared for an indefinite period. Whether he was led into this by alarm or some other impulse we cannot say, but no trace was seen of him for a time either at home or at the office. We will not attribute Semyon Ivanovitch's fate simply to his eccentricity, yet we must observe to the reader that our hero was a very retiring man, unaccustomed to society, and had, until he made the acquaintance of the new lodgers, lived in complete unbroken solitude, and had been marked by his quietness and even a certain mysteriousness for he had spent all the time that he lodged at Pesky, lying on his bed behind the screen, without talking or having any sort of relations with anyone. Both his old fellow lodgers lived exactly as he did. They, too, were somehow mysterious people, and spent fifteen years lying behind their screens. The happy, drowsy hours and days trailed by, one after the other, in patriarchal stagnation. And as everything around them went its way in the same happy fashion, neither Semyon Ivanovich nor Ustinya Fyodorovna could remember exactly when fate had brought them together. It may be ten years, it may be twenty, it may be even twenty-five altogether, she would say at times to her new lodgers, since he settled with me, poor dear man, bless his heart. And so it was very natural that the hero of our story, being so unaccustomed to society, was disagreeably surprised when, a year before, he, a respectable and modest man, had found himself suddenly in the midst of a noisy and boisterous crew, consisting of a dozen young fellows, his colleagues at the office, and his new housemates. The disappearance of Semyon Ivanovich made no little stir in the lodgings. One thing was that he was the favourite. Another, that his passport, which had been in the landlady's keeping, appeared to have been accidentally mislaid. Ustinya Fyodorovna raised a howl, as was her invariable habit on all critical occasions. She spent two days in abusing and upbraiding the lodgers. She wailed that they had chased away her lodger like a chicken, and all those spiteful scoffers had been the ruin of him. And on the third day, she sent them all out to hunt for the fugitive, and at all costs to bring him back dead or alive. Towards evening, Sudbin first came back with the news that traces had been discovered, that he had himself seen the runaway in Tolkuchi Market and other places, had followed and stood close to him, but had not dared to speak to him. He had been near him in a crowd watching a house on fire in Crooked Lane. Half an hour later, Okeanov and Kantarev came in and confirmed Sudbin's story, word for word. They, too, had stood near, had followed him quite close, had stood not more than ten paces from him, but they also had not ventured to speak to him, but both observed that Semyon Ivanovich was walking with a drunken cadger. The other lodgers were all back and together at last, and after listening attentively, they made up their minds that Prohartchin could not be far off and would not be long in returning. But they said that they had all known beforehand that he was about with a drunken cadger. This drunken cadger was a thoroughly bad lot, insolent and cringing, and it seemed evident that he had got round Semyon Ivanovich in some way. He had turned up just a week before Semyon Ivanovich's disappearance in company with Remnev, had spent a little time in the flat telling them that he had suffered in the cause of justice, that he had formerly been in the service in the provinces, that an inspector had come down on them, that he and his associates had somehow suffered in a good cause that he had come to Petersburg and fallen at the feet of Porfiry Grigorievich, that he had been got, by interest, into a department. But through the cruel persecution of fate, he had been discharged from there too, and that afterwards, through reorganisation, the office itself had ceased to exist, and that he had not been included in the new revised staff of clerks, owing as much to direct incapacity for official work as to capacity for something else quite irrelevant all this mixed up with his passion for justice and, of course, the trickery of his enemies. After finishing his story, in the course of which Mr. Zimovakin more than once kissed his sullen and unshaven friend Remnev, he bowed down to all in the room in turn, not forgetting Avdotia the servant, called them all his benefactors, and explained that he was an undeserving, troublesome, mean, 
insolent and stupid man, and that good people must not be hard on his pitiful plight and simplicity. After begging for their kind protection, Mr. Zimovakin showed his livelier side, grew very cheerful, kissed Ustinya Fyodorovna's hands, in spite of her modest protests that her hand was coarse and not like a lady's, and towards evening promised to show the company his talent in a remarkable character dance. But next day, his visit ended in a lamentable denouement, either because there had been too much character in the character dance, or because he had, in Ustinya Fyodorovna's own words, somehow insulted her and treated her as no lady, though she was on friendly terms with Yaroslav Ilyich himself, and if she liked, might long ago have been an officer's wife, Zimovakin had to steer for home next day. He went away, came back again, was again turned out with ignominy, then wormed his way into Semyon Ivanovich's good graces, robbed him incidentally of his new breeches, and now it appeared he had led Semyon Ivanovich astray. As soon as the landlady knew that Semyon Ivanovich was alive and well, and that there was no need to hunt for his passport, she promptly left off grieving and was pacified. Meanwhile, some of the lodgers determined to give the runaway a triumphal reception. They broke the bolt and moved away the screen from Mr. Prohartchin's bed, rumpled up the bed a little, took the famous box, put it at the foot of the bed, and on the bed laid the sister-in-law, that is, a dummy made up of an old kerchief, a cap, and a mantle of the landladies, such an exact counterfeit of a sister-in-law that it might have been mistaken for one. Having finished their work, they waited for Semyon Ivanovich to return, meaning to tell him that his sister-in-law had arrived from the country and was there behind his screen, poor thing. But they waited and waited. Already, while they waited, Mark Ivanovich had staked and lost half a month's salary to Prepolovenko and Kantarev. Already, Okeanov's nose had grown red and swollen, playing flips on the nose and three cards. Already, Avdotya the servant had almost had her sleep out and had twice been on the point of getting up to fetch the wood and light the stove. And Zinovy Prokofievich, who kept running out every minute to see whether Semyon Ivanovich were coming, was wet to the skin. But there was no sign of anyone yet, neither Semyon Ivanovich nor the drunken cadger. At last, everyone went to bed, leaving the sister-in-law behind the screen in readiness for any emergency. And it was not till four o'clock that a knock was heard at the gate, but when it did come, it was so loud that it quite made up to the expectant lodgers for all the wearisome trouble they had been through. It was he, he himself, Semyon Ivanovich, Mr. Prohartchin, but in such a condition that they all cried out in dismay and no one thought about the sister-in-law. The lost man was unconscious. He was brought in, or more correctly carried in, by a sopping and tattered nightcabman. To the landlady's question where the poor dear man had got so groggy, the cabman answered, Why, he is not drunk, and has not had a drop, that I can tell you for sure. But seemingly a faintness has come over him, or some sort of a fit, or maybe he's been knocked down by a blow. They began examining him, propping the culprit against the stove to do so more conveniently, and saw that it really was not a case of drunkenness, nor had he had a blow, but that something else was wrong for Semyon Ivanovich could not utter a word, but seemed twitching in a sort of convulsion, and only blinked, fixing his eyes in bewilderment, first on one and then on another of the spectators, who were all attired in night array. Then they began questioning the cabman, asking where he had got him from. Why, from folks out Kolomna way, he answered. Deuce knows what they are, not exactly gentry, but merry, rollicking gentlemen. So he was like this when they gave him to me. Whether they had been fighting, or whether he was in some sort of a fit, goodness knows what it was. But they were nice, jolly gentlemen. Semyon Ivanovich was taken, lifted high on the shoulders of two or three sturdy fellows, and carried to his bed. When Semyon Ivanovich, on being put in bed, felt the sister-in-law, and put his feet on his sacred box, he cried out at the top of his voice, squatted up almost on his heels, and trembling and shaking all over, with his hands and his body, he cleared a space as far as he could in his bed, while gazing with a tremulous but strangely resolute look at those present, 
he seemed, as it were, to protest that he would sooner die than give up the hundredth part of his poor belongings to anyone. Semyon Ivanovich lay for two or three days closely barricaded by the screen and so cut off from all the world and all its vain anxieties. Next morning, of course, everyone had forgotten about him. Time, meanwhile, flew by as usual, hour followed hour and day followed day. The sick man's heavy, feverish brain was plunged in something between sleep and delirium, but he lay quietly and did not moan or complain. On the contrary, he kept still and silent and controlled himself, lying low in his bed, just as the hare lies close to the earth when it hears the hunter. At times a long, depressing stillness prevailed in the flat, a sign that the lodgers had all gone to the office, and Semyon Ivanovich, waking up, could relieve his depression by listening to the bustle in the kitchen where the landlady was busy close by, or to the regular flop of Avdotya's downtrodden slippers as sighing and moaning she cleared away, rubbed and polished, tidying all the rooms in the flat. Whole hours passed by in that way, drowsy, languid, sleepy, wearisome, like the water that dripped with a regular sound from the locker into the basin in the kitchen. At last, the lodgers would arrive, one by one or in groups, and Semyon Ivanovich could very conveniently hear them abusing the weather, saying they were hungry, making a noise, smoking, quarrelling, and making friends, playing cards, and clattering the cups as they got ready for tea. Semyon Ivanovich mechanically made an effort to get up and join them, as he had a right to do at tea but he at once sank back into drowsiness and dreamed that he'd been sitting a long time at the tea table, having tea with them and talking, and that Zinovy Prokofievich had already seized the opportunity to introduce into the conversation some scheme concerning sisters-in-law and the moral relation of various worthy people to them. At this point, Semyon Ivanovich was in haste to defend himself and reply, but the mighty formula that flew from every tongue it has more than once been observed, cut short all his objections, and Semyon Ivanovich could do nothing better than begin dreaming again that today was the first of the month, and that he was receiving money in his office. Undoing the paper round it on the stairs, he looked about him quickly, and made haste as fast as he could to subtract half of the lawful wages he had received, and conceal it in his boot. Then, on the spot, on the stairs, quite regardless of the fact that he was in bed and asleep. He made up his mind when he reached home to give his landlady what was due for board and lodging, then to buy certain necessities, and to show anyone it might concern, as it were casually and unintentionally, that some of his salary had been deducted, that now he had nothing left to send his sister-in-law, then to speak with commiseration of his sister-in-law, to say a great deal about her the next day and the day after, and ten days later to say something casually again about her poverty that his companions might not forget. Making this determination, he observed that Andrei Efimovich, that everlastingly silent, bald little man who sat in the office three rooms from where Semyon Ivanovich sat and hadn't said a word to him for twenty years, was standing on the stairs, that he too was counting his silver roubles and shaking his head, he said to him, Money! If there's no money, there will be no porridge, he added grimly, as he went down the stairs, and just at the door he ended. And I have seven children, sir. Then the little bald man, probably equally unconscious that he was acting as a phantom and not as a substantial reality, held up his hand about thirty inches from the floor, and waving it vertically, muttered that the eldest was going to school then glancing with indignation at Semyon Ivanovich, as though it were Mr. Prohachin's fault that he was the father of seven, pulled his old hat down over his eyes, and with a whisk of his overcoat he turned to the left and disappeared. Semyon Ivanovich was quite frightened, and though he was fully convinced of his own innocence in regard to the unpleasant accumulation of seven under one roof, yet it seemed to appear that in fact no one else was to blame but Semyon Ivanovich. Panic-stricken, he set off running, for it seemed to him that the bald gentleman had turned back, was running after him, and meant to search him and take away all his salary, insisting upon the indisputable number seven, 
and resolutely denying any possible claim of any sort of sisters-in-law upon Semyon Ivanovich, Prohartchin ran and ran, gasping for breath. Beside him was running, too, an immense number of people, and all of them were jingling their money in the tail pockets of their skimpy little dress coats. At last, everyone ran up. There was the noise of fire engines, and whole masses of people carried him almost on their shoulders up to that same house on fire which he had watched last time in company with the drunken cadger. The drunken cadger, alias Mr. Zimovakin, was there now too. He met Semyon Ivanovich, made a fearful fuss, took him by the arm, and led him into the thickest part of the crowd. Just as then, in reality, all about them was the noise and uproar of an immense crowd of people, flooding the whole of Fontanka embankment between the two bridges, as well as all the surrounding streets and alleys. Just as then, Semyon Ivanovich, in company with the drunken cadger, was carried along behind a fence, where they were squeezed as though in pincers in a huge timber yard full of spectators who had gathered from the street, from Tolkuchi Market, and from all the surrounding houses, taverns, and restaurants. Semyon Ivanovich saw all this, and felt as he had done at the time. In the whirl of fever and delirium, all sorts of strange figures began flitting before him. He remembered some of them. One of them was a gentleman who had impressed everyone extremely, a man seven feet high, with whiskers half a yard long, who had been standing behind Semyon Ivanovich's back during the fire, and had given him encouragement from behind when our hero had felt something like ecstasy and had stamped as though intending thereby to applaud the gallant work of the fireman, from which he had an excellent view from his elevated position. Another was the sturdy lad from whom our hero had received a shove by way of a lift onto another fence, when he had been disposed to climb over it, possibly to save someone. He had a glimpse, too, of the figure of the old man with a sickly face in an old, wadded dressing gown tied round the waist, who had made his appearance before the fire in a little shop buying sugar and tobacco for his lodger, and who now, with a milk can and a quart pot in his hands, made his way through the crowd to the house in which his wife and daughter were burning together with thirteen and a half roubles in the corner under the bed. But most distinct of all was the poor, sinful woman of whom he had dreamed more than once during his illness. She stood before him now, as she had done then, in wretched bark shoes and rags, with a crutch and a wicker basket on her back. She! She was shouting more loudly than the firemen or the crowd, waving her crutch and her arms, saying that her own children had turned her out and that she had lost two coppers in consequence. The children and the coppers, the coppers and the children were mingled together in an utterly incomprehensible muddle from which everyone withdrew baffled after vain efforts to understand. But the woman would not desist. She kept wailing, shouting and waving her arms, seeming to pay no attention either to the fire up to which she had been carried by the crowd from the street or to the people about her or to the misfortune of strangers, or even to the sparks and red-hot embers which were beginning to fall in showers on the crowd standing near. At last, Mr. Prohartchin felt that a feeling of terror was coming upon him, for he saw clearly that all this was not, so to say, an accident, and that he would not get off scot-free. And indeed, upon the woodstack, close to him, was a peasant in a torn smock that hung loose about him, with his hair and beard singed, and he began stirring up all the people against Semyon Ivanovich. The crowd pressed closer and closer, the peasant shouted, and foaming at the mouth with horror, Mr. Prohartchin suddenly realised that this peasant was a cabman whom he had cheated five years before in the most inhuman way, slipping away from him without paying through a side gate and jerking up his heels as he ran as though he were barefoot on hot bricks. In despair, Mr. Prohartchin tried to speak, to scream, but his voice failed him. He felt that the infuriated crowd was twining round him like a many-coloured snake, strangling him, crushing him. He made an incredible effort and awoke. Then he saw that he was on fire, that all his corner was on fire, that his screen was on fire, that the whole flat was on fire, 
together with Ustinya Fyodorovna and all her lodgers, that his bed was burning, his pillow, his quilt, his box, and last of all, his precious mattress. Semyon Ivanovich jumped up, clutched at the mattress, and ran, dragging it after him. But in the landlady's room into which, regardless of decorum, our hero ran just as he was, barefoot and in his shirt, he was seized, held tight, and triumphantly carried back behind the screen, which meanwhile was not on fire. It seemed that it was rather Semyon Ivanovich's head that was on fire and was put back to bed. It was just as some tattered, unshaven, ill-humoured organ grinder puts away in his travelling box the punch who has been making an upset, drubbing all the other puppets, selling his soul to the devil, and that who at last ends his existence, till the next performance, in the same box with the devil, the negroes, the Pierrot, and Mademoiselle Caterina, with her fortunate lover, the captain. Immediately everyone, old and young, surrounded Semyon Ivanovich, standing in a row round his bed and fastening eyes full of expectation on the invalid. Meantime he had come to himself, but from shame or some other feeling, began pulling up the quilt over him, apparently wishing to hide himself under it from the attention of his sympathetic friends. At last, Mark Ivanovich was the first to break silence, and as a sensible man, he began saying in a very friendly way that Semyon Ivanovich must keep calm, that it was too bad and a shame to be ill, that only little children behaved like that, that he must get well and go to the office. Mark Ivanovich ended by a little joke, saying that no regular salary had yet been fixed for invalids, and as he knew for a fact that their grade would be very low in the service, to his thinking anyway, their calling or condition did not promise great and substantial advantages. In fact, it was evident that they were all taking genuine interest in Semyon Ivanovich's fate, and were very sympathetic. But with incomprehensible rudeness, Semyon Ivanovich persisted in lying in bed in silence and obstinately pulling the quilt higher and higher over his head. Mark Ivanovich, however, would not be gainsaid, and restraining his feelings, said something very honey to Semyon Ivanovich again, knowing that that was how he ought to treat a sick man. But Semyon Ivanovich would not feel this. On the contrary, he muttered something between his teeth with the most distrustful air, and suddenly began glancing askance from right to left in a hostile way, as though he would have reduced his sympathetic friends to ashes with his eyes. It was no use letting it stop there. Mark Ivanovich lost patience, and seeing that the man was offended and completely exasperated, and had simply made up his mind to be obstinate, told him straight out, without any softening suavity, that it was time to get up, that it was no use lying there, that shouting day and night about houses on fire, sisters-in-law, drunken cadgers, locks, boxes, and goodness knows what, was all stupid, improper, and degrading, for if Semyon Ivanovich did not want to sleep himself, he should not hinder other people, and please would he bear it in mind. This speech produced its effects, for Semyon Ivanovich, turning promptly to the orator, articulated firmly, though in a hoarse voice, you hold your tongue, puppy, you idle speaker, you foul-mouthed man. Do you hear, young dandy? Are you a prince, eh? Do you understand what I say? Hearing such insults, Mark Ivanovich fired up, but realising that he had to deal with a sick man, magnanimously overcame his resentment and tried to shame him out of his humour, but was cut short in that too. For Semyon Ivanovich observed at once that he would not allow people to play with him for all that Mark Ivanovich wrote poetry. Then followed a silence of two minutes. At last, recovering from his amazement, Mark Ivanovich, plainly, clearly, in well-chosen language, but with firmness, declared that Semyon Ivanovich ought to understand that he was among gentlemen, and, You ought to understand, sir, how to behave with gentlemen. Mark Ivanovich could on occasion speak effectively and like to impress his hearers, but probably from the habit of years of silence, Semyon Ivanovich talked and acted somewhat abruptly. And moreover, when he did on occasion begin a long sentence, as he got further into it, every word seemed to lead to another word, 
that other word to a third word, that third to a fourth, and so on, so that his mouth seemed brimming over. He began stuttering, and the crowding words took to flying out in picturesque disorder. That was why Semyon Ivanovich, who was a sensible man, sometimes talked terrible nonsense. You are lying, he said now. You booby, you loose fellow. You'll come to want. You'll go begging, you seditious fellow. You, you loafer. Take that, you poet. Why, you are still raving, aren't you, Semyon Ivanovich? I tell you what, answered Semyon Ivanovich. Fools rave, drunkards rave, dogs rave, but a wise man acts sensibly. I tell you, you don't know your own business, you loafer, you educated gentleman, you learned book. Here, you'll get on fire and not notice your heads burning off. What do you think of that? Why? You mean, how do you mean, burn my head off, Semyon Ivanovich? Mark Ivanovich said no more, for everyone saw clearly that Semyon Ivanovich was not yet in his sober senses, but delirious. But the landlady could not resist remarking at this point that the house in Crooked Lane had been burnt owing to a bald wench, that there was a bald-headed wench living there, that she had lighted a candle and set fire to the lumber room. But nothing would happen in her place, and everything would be all right in the flats. But look here, Semyon Ivanovich, cried Zinovy Prokofievich, losing patience and interrupting the landlady. You old fogey, you old crock, you silly fellow, are they making jokes with you now about your sister-in-law or examinations in dancing? Is that it? Is that what you think? Now, I tell you what, answered our hero, sitting up in bed and making a last effort in a paroxysm of fury with his sympathetic friends. Who's the fool? You are the fool. A dog is a fool, you joking gentleman. But I'm not going to make jokes to please you, sir. Do you hear, puppy? I'm not your servant, sir. Semyon Ivanovich would have said something more, but he fell back in bed, helpless. His sympathetic friends were left gaping in perplexity, for they understood now what was wrong with Semyon Ivanovich and did not know how to begin. Suddenly, the kitchen door creaked and opened, and the drunken cadger, alias Mr. Zimovakin, timidly thrust in his head, cautiously sniffing round the place as his habit was. It seemed as though he had been expected. Everyone waved to him at once to come quickly, and Zimovakin, highly delighted, with the utmost readiness and haste, jostled his way to Semyon Ivanovich's bedside. It was evident that Zimovakin had spent the whole night in vigil and in great exertions of some sort. The right side of his face was plastered up, his swollen eyelids were wet from his running eyes, his coat and all his clothes were torn, while the whole left side of his attire was bespattered with something extremely nasty, possibly mud from a puddle. Under his arm was somebody's violin, which he'd been taking somewhere to sell. Apparently, they had not made a mistake in summoning him to their assistance, for seeing the position of affairs, he addressed the delinquent at once, and with the air of a man who knows what he is about, and feels that he has the upper hand, said, What are you thinking about? Get up, Senka. What are you doing, a clever chap like you? Be sensible, or I shall pull you out of bed if you are obstreperous. Don't be obstreperous. This brief but forcible speech surprised them all. Still more were they surprised when they noticed that Semyon Ivanovich, hearing all this and seeing this person before him, was so flustered and reduced to such confusion and dismay that he could scarcely mutter through his teeth in a whisper the inevitable protest. Go away, you wretch, he said. You are a wretched creature. You are a thief. Do you hear? Do you understand? You are a great swell, my fine gentleman. You regular swell. No, my boy, Zimovakin answered emphatically, retaining all his presence of mind. You're wrong there, you wise fellow, you regular Prohachin, Zimovakin went on, parodying Semyon Ivanovich and looking round gleefully. Don't be obstreperous. Behave yourself, Senka. Behave yourself, or I'll give you away. I'll tell them all about it, my lad. Do you understand? Apparently, Semyon Ivanovich did understand, for he started when he heard the conclusion of the speech, and began looking rapidly about him with an utterly desperate air. 
Satisfied with the effect, Mr. Zimovakin would have continued, but Mark Ivanovich checked his zeal, and waiting till Semyon Ivanovich was still and almost calm again, began judiciously impressing on the uneasy invalid at great length that, to harbour ideas such as he now had in his head, was first useless, and secondly, not only useless, but harmful, and, in fact, not so much harmful as positively immoral. And the cause of it all was that Semyon Ivanovich was not only a bad example, but led them all into temptation. Everyone expected satisfactory results from this speech. Moreover, by now, Semyon Ivanovich was quite quiet and replied in measured terms. A quiet discussion followed. They appealed to him in a friendly way, inquiring what he was so frightened of. Semyon Ivanovich answered, but his answers were irrelevant. They answered him, he answered them. There were one or two more observations on both sides, and then everyone rushed into discussion, for suddenly such a strange and amazing subject cropped up that they did not know how to express themselves. The argument at last led to impatience. Impatience led to shouting, and shouting even to tears, and Mark Ivanovich went away at last, foaming at the mouth, and declaring that he had never known such a blockhead. Oplevaniev spat in disgust, Okeanov was frightened, Zinovy Prokofievich became tearful, while Ustinya Fyodorovna positively howled, wailing that her lodger was leaving them and had gone off his head, that he would die, poor dear man, without a passport and without telling anyone, while she was a lone, lorn woman, and that she would be dragged from pillar to post. In fact, they all saw clearly at last that the seed they had sown had yielded a hundredfold, that the soil had been too productive, and that in their company Semyon Ivanovich had succeeded in overstraining his wits completely and in the most irrevocable manner. Everyone subsided into silence, for though they saw that Semyon Ivanovich was frightened, the sympathetic friends were frightened too. What? cried Mark Ivanovich. But what are you afraid of? What have you gone off your head about? Who's thinking about you, my good sir? Have you the right to be afraid? Who are you? What are you? Nothing, sir. A round naught, sir, that is what you are. What are you making a fuss about? A woman has been run over in the street, so are you going to be run over? Some drunkard did not take care of his pocket, but is that any reason why your coattails should be cut off? A house is burnt down, so your head is to be burnt off, is it? Is that it, sir? Is that it? You, you, you stupid, muttered Semyon Ivanovich. If your nose were cut off, you would eat it up with a bit of bread and not notice it. I may be a dandy, shouted Mark Ivanovich, not listening. I may be a regular dandy, but I have not to pass an examination to get married, to learn dancing. The ground is firm under me, sir. Why, my good man, haven't you room enough? Is the floor giving way under your feet, or what? Well, they won't ask you, will they? They'll shut one up, and that will be the end of it? The end of it? That's what's up. What's your idea now, eh? Why, they kicked out the drunken cadger. Yes, but you see that was a drunkard, and you are a man, and so am I. Yes, I am a man. It's there all right one day, and then it's gone. Gone? But what do you mean by it? Why, the office, the off, office. Yes, you bless man, but of course the office is wanted and necessary. It is wanted, I tell you. It's wanted today and it's wanted tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow it will not be wanted. You have heard what happened? Why, but they'll pay you your salary for the year, you doubting Thomas, you man of little faith. They'll put you into another job on account of your age. Salary? But what if I have spent my salary, if thieves come and take my money? And I have a sister-in-law, do you hear? A sister-in-law, you battering ram. A sister-in-law, you are a man. Yes, I am. I am a man. But you are a well-read gentleman and a fool, do you hear? You battering ram. You regular battering ram. That's what you are. I am not talking about your jokes, but there are jobs such that all of a sudden they are done away with. And Demid. Do you hear? Demid Vasilievich says that the post will be done away with. 
Ah, bless you with your demid, you sinner, why, you know. In a twinkling of an eye you'll be left without a post, then you'll just have to make the best of it. Why, you are simply raving or clean off your head. Tell us plainly, what have you done? Own up if you have done something wrong. It's no use being ashamed. Are you off your head, my good man, eh? He's off his head. He's gone off his head, they all cried, and wrung their hands in despair, while the landlady threw both her arms round Mark Ivanovich for fear he should tear Semyon Ivanovich to pieces. You heathen, you heathenish soul, you wise man, Zimovakin besought him. Senka, you're not a man to take offence. You're a polite, prepossessing man. You are simple. You are good. Do you hear? It all comes from your goodness. Here I am a ruffian and a fool. I am a beggar. But good people haven't abandoned me, no fear. You see, they treat me with respect. I thank them and the landlady. Here, you see, I bow down to the ground to them. Here, see, see, I am paying what is due to you, landlady. At this point, Zimovakin swung off with pedantic dignity, a low bow right down to the ground. After that, Semyon Ivanovich would have gone on talking, but this time they would not let him. They all intervened, began entreating him, assuring him, comforting him, and succeeded in making Semyon Ivanovich thoroughly ashamed of himself, and at last, in a faint voice, he asked leave to explain himself. Very well, then, he said. I am prepossessing, I am quiet, I am good, faithful and devoted, to the last drop of my blood you know. Do you hear, you puppy, you swell? Granted the job is going on, but you see I am poor, and what if they take it? Do you hear, you swell? Hold your tongue and try to understand, they'll take it, and that's all about it. It's going on, brother, and they're not going on. Do you understand? and I shall go begging my bread, do you hear? Senka, Zimovakin bawled frantically, drowning the general hubbub with his voice. You are seditious. I'll inform against you. What are you saying? Who are you? Are you a rebel, you sheep's head? A rowdy, stupid man they would turn off without a character. But what are you? Well, that's just it. What? Well, there it is. How do you mean? Why, I am free, he's free, and here one lies and thinks. What? What if they say I'm seditious? C, D, Tyus, Senka, you seditious! Stay, cried Mr. Prohartchin, waving his hand and interrupting the rising uproar. That's not what I mean. Try to understand, only try to understand, you sheep. I am law-abiding. I am law-abiding today. I am law-abiding tomorrow and then all of a sudden they kick me out and call me seditious. What are you saying? Mark Ivanovich thundered at last, jumping up from the chair on which he had sat down to rest, running up to the bed and in a frenzy shaking with vexation and fury. What do you mean? You sheep! You've nothing to call your own. Why, are you the only person in the world? Was the world made for you, do you suppose? Are you a Napoleon? What are you? Who are you? Are you a Napoleon, eh? Tell me, are you a Napoleon? But Mr. Prohartchin did not answer this question, not because he was overcome with shame at being a Napoleon and was afraid of taking upon himself such a responsibility. No, he was incapable of disputing further or saying anything. His illness had reached a crisis. Tiny teardrops gushed suddenly from his glittering, feverish grey eyes. He hid his burning head in his bony hands that were wasted by illness, sat up in bed and sobbing, began to say that he was quite poor, that he was a simple, unlucky man, that he was foolish and unlearned. He begged kind folks to forgive him, to take care of him, to protect him, to give him food and drink, not to leave him in want, and goodness knows what else Semyon Ivanovich said. As he uttered this appeal, he looked about him in wild terror, as though he were expecting the ceiling to fall or the floor to give way. Everyone felt his heart soften and move to pity as he looked at the poor fellow. The landlady, sobbing and wailing like a peasant woman at her forlorn condition, laid the invalid back in bed with her own hands. 
Mark Ivanovich, seeing the uselessness of touching upon the memory of Napoleon, instantly relapsed into kindliness and came to her assistance. The others, in order to do something, suggested raspberry tea, saying that it always did good at once and that the invalid would like it very much. But Zimovakin contradicted them all, saying there was nothing better than a good dose of chamomile or something of the sort. As for Zinovy Prokofievich, having a good heart, he sobbed and shed tears in his remorse for having frightened Semyon Ivanovich with all sorts of absurdities, and gathering from the invalid's last words that he was quite poor and needing assistance, he proceeded to get up a subscription for him, confining it for a time to the tenants of the flat. Everyone was sighing and moaning, everyone felt sorry and grieved, and yet all wondered how it was a man could be so completely panic-stricken. And what was he frightened about? It would have been all very well if he had had a good post, had had a wife, a lot of children. It would have been excusable if he were being hauled up before the court on some charge or other. But he was a man utterly insignificant, with nothing but a trunk and a German lock. He had been lying more than twenty years behind his screen, saying nothing, knowing nothing of the world nor of trouble, saving his halfpence, and now at a frivolous, idle word the man had actually gone off his head, was utterly panic-stricken at the thought he might have a hard time of it, and it never occurred to him that everyone has a hard time of it. If he would only take that into consideration, Okeanov said afterwards, that we all have a hard time, then the man would have kept his head, would have given up his antics, and would have put up with things, one way or another. All day long, nothing was talked of but Semyon Ivanovich. They went up to him, inquired after him, tried to comfort him, but by the evening he was beyond that. The poor fellow began to be delirious, feverish. He sank into unconsciousness so that they almost thought of sending for a doctor. The lodgers all agreed together and undertook to watch over Semyon Ivanovich and soothe him by turns through the night and if anything happened to wake all the rest immediately. With the object of keeping awake, they sat down to cards, setting beside the invalid his friend, the drunken cadger, who had spent the whole day in the flat and had asked leave to stay the night. As the game was played on credit and was not at all interesting, they soon got bored. They gave up the game, then got into an argument about something, then began to be loud and noisy, finally dispersed to their various corners, went on for a long time, angrily shouting and wrangling, and as all of them felt suddenly ill-humoured, they no longer cared to sit up, so went to sleep. Soon it was as still in the flat as in an empty cellar, and it was the more like one because it was horribly cold. The last to fall asleep was Okeanov, and it was between sleeping and waking, as he said afterwards, I fancied just before morning two men kept talking close by me. Okeanov said that he recognized Zimovakin, and that Zimovakin began waking his old friend Remnev just beside him, that they talked for a long time in a whisper. Then Zimovakin went away and could be heard trying to unlock the door into the kitchen. The key, the landlady declared afterwards, was lying under her pillow and was lost that night. Finally, Okeanov testified, he had fancied he had heard them go behind the screen to the invalid and light a candle there. And I know nothing more, he said. I fell asleep and woke up, as everybody else did, when everyone in the flat jumped out of bed at the sound behind the screen of a shriek that would have roused the dead. And it seemed to many of them that a candle went out at that moment. A great hubbub arose. Everyone's heart stood still. They rushed pell mell at the shriek. But at that moment, there was a scuffle with shouting, swearing, and fighting. They struck a light and saw that. Zimovakin and Remnev were fighting together, that they were swearing and abusing one another, and as they turned the light on them, one of them shouted, It's not me, it's this ruffian, and the other, who was Zimovakin, was shouting, Don't touch me, I've done nothing, I'll take my oath any minute. Both of them looked hardly like human beings, but for the first minute they had no attention to spare for them. The invalid was not where he had been behind the screen. They immediately parted the combatants and dragged them away, and saw that Mr. Prohartchin was lying under the bed, 
He must, while completely unconscious, have dragged the quilt and pillow after him so that there was nothing left on the bedstead but the bare mattress, old and greasy. He never had sheets. They pulled Semyon Ivanovich out, stretched him on the mattress, but soon realised that there was no need to make trouble over him, that he was completely done for. His arms were stiff, and he seemed all to pieces. They stood over him. He still faintly shuddered and trembled all over, made an effort to do something with his arms, could not utter a word, but blinked his eyes as they say heads do when still warm and bleeding after being just chopped off by the executioner. At last the body grew more and more still, the last faint convulsions died away. Mr. Poprohachin had set off with his good deeds and his sins. Whether Semyon Ivanovich had been frightened by something, whether he had had a dream, as Remnev maintained afterwards, or there had been some other mischief, nobody knew. All that can be said is that if the head clerk had made his appearance at that moment in the flat and had announced that Semyon Ivanovich was dismissed for sedition, insubordination, and drunkenness, if some old draggle-tailed beggar woman had come in at the door, calling herself Semyon Ivanovich's sister-in-law, or if Semyon Ivanovich had just received two hundred roubles as a reward, or if the house had caught fire and Semyon Ivanovich's head had been really burning, he would in all probability not have deigned to stir a finger in any of these eventualities. While the first stupefaction was passing over, while all present were regaining their powers of speech, were working themselves up into a fever of excitement, shouting and flying to conjectures and suppositions, while Ustinya Fyodorovna was pulling the box from under his bed, was rummaging in a fluster under the mattress, and even in Semyon Ivanovich's boots, while they cross-questioned Remnev and Zimovakin, Okeanov, who had hitherto been the quietest, humblest, and least original of the lodgers, suddenly plucked up all his presence of mind and displayed all his latent talents by taking up his hat and under cover of the general uproar slipping out of the flat and just when the horrors of disorder and anarchy had reached their height in the agitated flat, till then so tranquil, the door opened, and suddenly there descended upon them, like snow upon their heads, a personage of gentlemanly appearance, with a severe and displeased-looking face. Behind him, Yaroslav Ilyich. Behind Yaroslav Ilyich, his subordinates and the functionaries whose duty it is to be present on such occasions, and behind them all, much embarrassed, Mr. Okeanov. The severe-looking personage of gentlemanly appearance went straight up to Semyon Ivanovich, examined him, made a wry face, shrugged his shoulders, and announced what everybody knew, that is, that the dead man was dead, only adding that the same thing had happened a day or two ago to a gentleman of consequence, highly respected, who had died suddenly in his sleep. Then the personage of gentlemanly but displeased-looking appearance walked away, saying that they had troubled him for nothing, and took himself off. His place was at once filled, while Remnev and Zimovakin were handed over to the custody of the proper functionaries, by Yaroslav Ilyich, who questioned someone, adroitly took possession of the box, which the landlady was already trying to open, put the boots back in their proper place, observing that they were all in holes and no use, asked for the pillow to be put back, called up Okenov, asked for the key of the box which was found in the pocket of the drunken cadger, and solemnly, in the presence of the proper officials, unlocked Semyon Ivanovich's property. Everything was displayed. Two rags, a pair of socks, half a handkerchief, an old hat, several buttons, some old soles, and the uppers of a pair of boots, that is, all sorts of odds and ends, scraps, rubbish, trash, which had a stale smell. The only thing of any value was the German lock. They called up Okeanov and cross-questioned him sternly, but Okeanov was ready to take his oath. They asked for the pillow, they examined it. It was extremely dirty, but in other respects it was like all other pillows. They attacked the mattress. They were about to lift it up, but stopped for a moment's consideration when suddenly and quite unexpectedly something heavy fell with a clink on the floor. They bent down and saw on the floor a screw of paper, and in the screw some dozen roubles. Ah, hey, 
said Yaroslav Ilyich, pointing to a slit in the mattress from which hair and stuffing were sticking out. They examined the slit and found that it had only just been made with a knife and was half a yard in length. They thrust hands into the gap and pulled out a kitchen knife, probably hurriedly thrust in there after slitting the mattress. Before Yaroslav Ilyich had time to pull the knife out of the slit and to say, Hey, hey! Again, another screw of money fell out, and after it, one at a time, two half rubles, a quarter ruble, then some small change, and an old fashioned, solid five kopeck piece. All this was seized upon. At this point, it was realized that it would not be amiss to cut up the whole mattress with scissors. They asked for scissors. Meanwhile, the guttering candle lighted up a scene that would have been extremely curious to a spectator. About a dozen lodgers were grouped round the bed in the most picturesque costumes, all unbrushed, unshaven, unwashed, sleepy-looking, just as they had gone to bed. Some were quite pale, while others had drops of sweat upon their brows. Some were shuddering, while others looked feverish. The landlady, utterly stupefied, was standing quietly with her hands folded, waiting for Yaroslav Ilyich's good pleasure. From the stove above, the heads of Avdotya, the servant, and the landlady's favourite cat looked down with frightened curiosity. The torn and broken screen lay cast on the floor, the open box displayed its uninviting contents, the quilt and pillow lay tossed at random, covered with fluff from the mattress, and on the three-legged wooden table gleamed the steadily growing heap of silver and other coins. Only Semyon Ivanovich preserved his composure, lying calmly on the bed and seeming to have no foreboding of his ruin. When the scissors had been brought and Yaroslav Ilyich's assistant, wishing to be of service, shook the mattress rather impatiently to ease it from under the back of its owner, Semyon Ivanovich, with his habitual civility, made room a little, rolling on his side with his back to the searchers. Then, at a second shake, he turned on his face finally gave way still further, and as the last slat in the bedstead was missing, he suddenly and quite unexpectedly plunged head downward, leaving in view only two bony, thin, blue legs, which stuck upwards like two branches of a charred tree. As this was the second time that morning that Mr. Prohartchin had poked his head under his bed, it at once aroused suspicion, and some of the lodgers, headed by Zinovy Prokofievich, crept under it, with the intention of seeing whether there were something hidden there, too. But they knocked their heads together for nothing, and as Yaroslav Ilyich shouted to them, bidding them release Semyon Ivanovich at once from his unpleasant position, two of the more sensible seized each a leg, dragged the unsuspected capitalist into the light of day, and laid him across the bed. Meanwhile, the hare and flock were flying about, the heap of silver grew, and my goodness, what a lot there was! Noble silver rubles, stout solid ruble and a half pieces, pretty half ruble coins, plebeian quarter rubles, twenty kopeck pieces, even the unpromising old crone's small fry of ten and five kopeck silver pieces, all done up in separate bits of paper in the most methodical and systematic way. There were curiosities also, two counters of some sort, one Napoleon d'Or, one very rare coin of some unknown kind, some of the rubles were of the greatest antiquity. They were rubbed and hacked coins of Elizabeth, German kreutzers, coins of Peter, of Catherine. There were, for in instance, old fifteen kopeck pieces, now very rare, pierced for wearing as earrings, all much worn, yet with the requisite number of dots. There was even copper, but all of that was green and tarnished. They found one red note, but no more. At last, when the dissection was quite over and the mattress case had been shaken more than once without a clink, they piled all the money on the table and set to work to count it. At the first glance, one might well have been deceived and have estimated it at a million. It was such an immense heap. But it was not a million, though it did turn out to be a very considerable sum, exactly 24.97 rubles and a half so that if Zinovy Prokofievich's subscription had been raised the day before, there would perhaps have been just 2,500 roubles. They took the money, they put a seal on the dead man's box, 
They listened to the landlady's complaints and informed her when and where she ought to lodge information in regard to the dead man's little debt to her. A receipt was taken from the proper person. At that point, hints were dropped in regard to the sister-in-law. But being persuaded that in a certain sense the sister-in-law was a myth, that is, a product of the defective imagination with which they had more than once reproached Semyon Ivanovich, they abandoned the idea as useless, mischievous and disadvantageous to the good name of Mr. Prohartchin, and so the matter ended. When the first shock was over, when the lodgers had recovered themselves and realised the sort of person their late companion had been, they all subsided, relapsed into silence and began looking distrustfully at one another. Some seemed to take Semyon Ivanovich's behaviour very much to heart and even to feel affronted by it. What a fortune! So the man had saved up like this. Not losing his composure, Mark Ivanovich proceeded to explain why Semyon Ivanovich had been so suddenly panic-stricken, but they did not listen to him. Zinovy Prokofievich was very thoughtful. Okeanov had had a little to drink, the others seemed rather crestfallen, while a little man called Kantarev, with a nose like a sparrow's beak, left the flat that evening after very carefully packing up and cording all his boxes and bags and coldly explaining to the curious that times were hard and that the terms here were beyond his means. The landlady wailed without ceasing, lamenting for Semyon Ivanovich and cursing him for having taken advantage of her lone, lorn state. Mark Ivanovich was asked why the dead man had not taken his money to the bank. He was too simple, my good soul. He hadn't enough imagination, answered Mark Ivanovich. Yes, and you have been too simple too, my good woman, Okeanov put in. For twenty years the man kept himself close here in your flat, and here he's been knocked down by a feather, while you went on cooking cabbage soup and had no time to notice it. Ah, ah, my good woman. Oh, the poor dear, the landlady went on. What need of a bank? If he'd brought me his pile and said to me, Take it, Ustinyushka, poor dear. Here is all I have. Keep and board me in my helplessness, so long as I am on earth. Then, by the holy icon I would have fed him, I would have given him drink, I would have looked after him. Ah, the sinner, ah, the deceiver. He deceived me, he cheated me, a poor lone woman. They went up to the bed again. Semyon Ivanovich was lying properly now, dressed in his best, though, indeed, it was his only suit, hiding his rigid chin behind a cravat, which was tied rather awkwardly, washed, brushed, but not quite shaven, because there was no razor in the flat. The only one, which had belonged to Zinovy Prokofievich, had lost its edge a year ago and had been very profitably sold at Tolkuchi Market. The others used to go to the barber's. They had not yet had time to clear up the disorder. The broken screen lay as before, and exposing Semyon Ivanovich's seclusion seemed like an emblem of the fact that death tears away the veil from all our secrets, our shifty dodges and intrigues. The stuffing from the mattress lay about in heaps. The whole room, suddenly so still, might well have been compared by a poet to the ruined nest of a swallow broken down and torn to pieces by the storm, the nestlings and their mother killed, and their warm little bed of fluff, feather and flock scattered about them. Semyon Ivanovich, however, looked more like a conceited, thievish old cock sparrow. He kept quite quiet now, seemed to be lying low, as though he were not guilty, as though he had had nothing to do with the shameless, conscienceless and unseemly duping and deception of all these good people. He did not heed now the sobs and wailing of his bereaved and wounded landlady. On the contrary, like a wary, callous capitalist, anxious not to waste a minute in idleness even in the coffin, he seemed to be wrapped up in some speculative calculation. There was a look of deep reflection in his face, while his lips were drawn together with a significant air, of which Semyon Ivanovich during his lifetime had not been suspected of being capable. He seemed, as it were, to have grown shrewder. His right eye was, as it were, slyly screwed up. Semyon Ivanovich seemed wanting to say something, to make some very important communication and explanation, and without loss of time, because things were complicated and there was not a minute to lose. 
and it seemed as though they could hear him. What is it? Give over, do you hear, you stupid woman? Don't whine. Go to bed and sleep it off, my good woman, do you hear? I am dead. There's no need of a fuss now. What's the use of it, really? It's nice to lie here. Though I don't mean that, do you hear? You are a fine lady. You are a regular fine lady. Understand that. Here I am dead now. But look here. What if... That is, perhaps it can't be so. But I say, what if I'm not dead? What if I get up? Do you hear? What would happen then? <laughs>